To be on the periphery of something means to be on the outskirts of it, to be on the edge of it, but not of it. The Inland Empire, a metropolitan region just outside of Los Angeles proper, is peripheral to Los Angeles. It's right there outside that main thing, and in a broader definition of Los Angeles, you might also include the Inland Empire of that broader thing, but it's technically separate. In the world of video games, a peripheral is a device that adds some new functionality to a gaming system, but which is still itself separate from that system. One of the most popular and successful gaming peripherals of all time was the NES Zapper, otherwise known as the gun that game packaged with the original Nintendo Entertainment System console. The Zapper only worked with 16 official licensed games on the NES. And the majority of people who had one only ever used it with the game that it came packaged with, Duck Hunt, which was a game in which you would shoot at pixelated ducks as they emerged from a grassland at varying speeds. And your also pixelated hunting dog, who was ostensibly on your side, would laugh at you if your performance was subpar. This was what video games were like in the 80s. To play the NES, you had to plug it into your TV so that you'd have a display. And TVs were relatively dumb machines back in the mid-80s when this device first hit shelves. No internet, no interactivity, just a few cables that plugged into the back, sending audio and video from the console to the screen. So to make this peripheral work, the developers at Nintendo had to get clever. The gun barrel was a very simple machine. It could detect black and white illumination on old-school CRT screens. When you pulled the trigger on the gun, the TV screen would flash pure black for a fraction of a second, and then for another fraction of a second, everything that was a target, in this case the ducks, would flash as white shapes against that black screen. All of this would happen faster than the human eye could process it, which resulted in most people seeing what seemed to be like a muzzle flash when they fired the gun, but the flash was actually the gun seeing if you were pointed at a duck or some part of the screen that wasn't a duck by differentiating between black and white on your TV. The Zapper wasn't the only non-standard gun controller peripheral ever developed by Nintendo, not by a long shot. The NES Advantage was a joystick-based controller that looked like the controls that you would more frequently see on arcade games at the time, while the power pad was a short-lived, immensely unpopular, and unsuccessful floor-based controller that looked a bit like a twister board, if you've ever played that. And you could unroll this massive controller and step on it to use it. But it didn't trigger very accurately, and it worked with even fewer and far lower quality games than the Zapper. The NES Power Glove was wildly popular for a time, despite being, by most accounts, a truly abysmal product. Imagine a kind of robot glove that you could wear on your hand, and then slap a Nintendo controller, along with some extra shortcut buttons that do god knows what on the forearm. That's basically what the Power Glove was. So as a functional controller, it was clunky and difficult to use. As a product, though, it was quite successful because it was featured in The Wizard, which was a film produced by Nintendo starring Fred Savage to essentially launch the video game Super Mario Bros. 3 for the NES. So it was a real in-theaters film with real A-list actors that more or less served as a commercial for a new Mario game and this Power Glove controller. The 80s really were simpler times. I would be remiss if I didn't also mention the Nintendo... ROB, an acronym for Robotic Operating Buddy. This concept was far ahead of its time, you could probably say. It was a robot that plugged into your video game console that would watch the screen, much like the zapper gun, to receive visual commands from the game you were playing. This robot toy wasn't very good or very well reviewed. It worked with only two quite terrible games, and its functionality was incredibly limited. 
it stacked blocks mostly and your goal was generally to get the rob to stack blocks so that the blocks you had in your living room with your real physical robot matched the block stacks that you saw on your TV screen, which were being stacked by a digital robot. Not the most compelling storyline ever to be presented in a video game. But as a marketing tactic, the rob was brilliant. After the US video game crash of 1983, many experts were declaring that video games, particularly at home consoles, were dead. They had their chance and they failed. It would not be a thing. Video games were a flash in the pan. The Rob, along with other peripherals, but the Rob in particular, stands out in this regard. It was a Trojan horse product that allowed Nintendo to position its Nintendo Entertainment System as a high-end, technologically sophisticated toy, rather than a video game console like the recently deceased offerings by Atari, ColecoVision, and Intellivision, among others. These peripherals, then, saved Nintendo, but also the at-home console market as a whole. After the immense promise and massive letdown of the first wave of purpose-built at-home consoles, which were essentially simple computers made for kids that you plugged into your TV, there was a very good chance that the whole industry would disappear and never come back or at the very least would be set aside until many, many years in the future. Instead, we got Nintendo, and then the Sega Genesis, and then the Super Nintendo, and eventually Sony and Microsoft entered the market with their PlayStation and Xbox consoles. This industry went on to influence a great many things, including the realms of broader computing. The contemporary artificial intelligence explosion is occurring, in part, because of the development of sophisticated graphics processing hardware, which was built for and funded by the video game console industry. The consumer application argument for a lot of the AI in the world today is a tough sell, at least directly. But video games have gone on to become one of the biggest consumer markets in the world. There is gold in those digital hills. And that's what I want to talk about today. The video game industry as a whole, but also what's happening to gaming during a moment in which we all have little supercomputers in our pockets and the marvels of the digital world, better graphics, better gameplay, faster machines, have become more or less commonplace. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. It's worth mentioning, from the outset, that Nintendo started out as a card game company. They made a product called Hanafuda, which is Japanese for flower cards. Essentially, this was a Portuguese-inspired Japanese card deck that operated in a similar way to the typical 52-card deck that many people in the Western world will be familiar with, with hearts and diamonds and clubs and so on. Their cards were handmade and very beautiful, and the business did well. They went on to sell their cards outside of Japan, in addition to within their own country, and funded their own card game tournaments under the name Nintendo Cup. The playing card facet of Nintendo peaked in the mid-1960s when the company licensed Disney characters to put on their playing cards. Nintendo's owners then invested in a flurry of new and somewhat strange endeavors, including, but not limited to, a taxi company, a TV network, an instant rice company, and a love hotel chain. That's right, Nintendo owned a chain of hotels where you paid by the hour. These ventures all eventually failed, and by 1964, their playing card department was also failing. That year, Nintendo stock hit its lowest ever price of 60 yen per share, or approximately 54 cents US. Nintendo developed their first toy in 1966, the Ultra Hand was an accordion gripper that you could use to grab things from a distance. They also produced the Ultra Machine, which would lob balls that you could hit with a bat. And they produced the Love Tester, which was a machine that two people would hold, and it would then display a love compatibility score between 1 and 100. The company was consistently beat in the toy space by the better established and better funded Bandai and Tomy, 
And because they were so outmatched in that space, Nintendo tried its hand at arcade games, which were, at the time, primarily placed in bowling alleys. Their first attempt at such a game, the Laser Clay Shooting System, made use of a laser gun and CRT display, very similar to the technology that their NES-based zapper gun would later make use of. The early electronics era was something of a golden age for the Japanese economy. From the mid-70s through the late 1990s, the world was convinced that Japan was going to take over the global economy. The country's microchip production capabilities were second to none, and they were able to take concepts invented in other countries and riff on them, making them more efficient and effective, not to mention cheap. During this period, Nintendo acquired the rights to distribute the Magnavox Odyssey video game console in Japan, which allowed them to dip their toes into the at-home video game console market. From there, they began to produce their own system, which was called the Color TV Game, the first version of which would allow buyers to play what amounted to an off-brand version of Pong, a game where you controlled a line and faced off against another line in an effort to score a goal using a square that served as a ball. But that system also included tennis, hockey, and volleyball, all of which were very similar to Pong, but with slightly different rules. Notably, a young man named Shigeru Miyamoto was hired as a student product developer around this time, and his first task was to design the plastic casing for several iterations of the color TV game console. Miyamoto would later become famous for inventing Nintendo's Mario character, among many other characters a significant percentage of the global population would come to recognize. Mario made his initial appearance in an arcade game called Donkey Kong, which was released in 1981, though at the time, Mario was called Jumpman. The game did well in arcades and was later ported to the Atari 2600 in television and ColecoVision gaming consoles, which brought Nintendo a profit infusion that allowed it to invest in a slew of successful handheld gaming systems, including the Game & Watch series which was based on the rudimentary LCD screens that were at the time found in high-end calculators. The little D-pad controller design, the cross with an up and a down and a left and a right button that are found in most game console controllers today, was invented for a portable version of Donkey Kong, and the design was patented by Nintendo. The Nintendo Famicom, a portmanteau of family computer, was released in Japan in 1983. The Famicom featured ports of its popular arcade games, including Donkey Kong. And in 1985, a version of the Famicom, which was redesigned to appeal to Western audiences, was released in North America as the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES. The modern version of the Nintendo brand emerged from a decision to bundle the original Super Mario Bros. game with the NES, ensuring that everyone who bought the game console would play that game first. This is what gave their Mario character so much exposure, and it's what helped define the Nintendo brand as a separate and more desirable product category when compared to all the other electronics and gaming companies of that period. From there, Nintendo launched the Game Boy, which was a mainstream riff on their Game & Watch calculator LCD-based games that they had produced a decade before. The Super Nintendo, based on the Super Famicom, doubled the processing power of the NES and set the tone of the early 90s gaming scene. It also triggered a market war between Nintendo and another Japanese gaming company, Sega, which was a rivalry that defined the childhood of many kids growing up in the early 90s, myself included. That rivalry, by the way, is well captured in the non-fiction book Console Wars, which is apparently being turned into a movie. Then came the Nintendo 64, the Virtual Boy, a flurry of Game Boy descendants, each of them smaller and more colorful than the last. The GameCube was followed by the Wii. The Game Boy Advance was followed by the Nintendo DS. Nintendo's most recent iteration, I would argue, emerged with the release of those last two devices, the DS and the Wii. The former was a portable device, kind of like a Game Boy, but with a flip-up panel that revealed two screens, 
one traditional LCD and one touchscreen that players could interact with using their finger or a stylus. The latter was a TV-based console that made use of gyroscopes, a pointing laser, and internet connectivity. And these motion tracking sensors and connectivity opened up the world of gaming to people who had never felt particularly compelled to participate before due to the friction of traditional game interfaces and their cultural conventions. That, I think, is a good place to segue into the article that I want to unspool today. This piece comes from The Verge, and it's entitled, Nintendo is making a bunch of weird DIY cardboard toys for the Switch, and they're awesome. And the subtitle is, Build Your Own Fishing Rod, Piano, or Robot Suit. This article, and a slew of others like it, most of which were published on the day of the announcement of a new product called Nintendo Labo, addresses a new product category that Nintendo is releasing alongside its Nintendo Switch gaming console. And to understand the Labo product, you must first understand the Nintendo Switch, which itself is fairly unique and complex. The Switch is the seventh major console developed by Nintendo, meaning it's not an iteration or upgrade of a previous product, like the many variations of the handheld DS system that have emerged over the years. This is a new thing, and though it bears a passing resemblance to the Nintendo Wii U, that resemblance is fairly superficial. The Switch is a console that can be plugged into your television or monitor, but it's also a handheld device that is about the same shape and size of an iPad or other tablet, though it's substantially bulkier. It's about a half an inch or 1.4 centimeters thick, compared to many modern tablets that are less than a third of an inch or around 7 millimeters thick. That main tablet-like console can operate independently or it can be tucked into a dock which is what charges it and connects it to your TV. On either side of the tablet are slots into which you can slide small controllers called Joy-Cons. These Joy-Cons have joysticks and a handful of buttons apiece, which allows each of them to operate as independent wireless controllers, or you can use them together as grips and controllers when they are slotted into the tablet, making that tablet kind of like a massive touchscreen Game Boy. So two people can use them, these little Joy-Cons, as simpler controllers to play a game together on the tablet, which has a kickstand, so that it can operate as a portable multiplayer console slash TV, or they can play a game on a traditional TV screen. These Joy-Cons, in addition to being wireless, are also packed with gyroscopes, infrared depth sensors, accelerometers, a near-field communication reader, and a haptic feedback system that allows them to vibrate at varying levels. What this means in practice is that each little Joy-Con operates like a sophisticated Wii controller, allowing it to sense movement and even hand gestures while also vibrating in response to things that happen on screen. The end result of this collection of hardware pieces is three main ways to use the system. There's TV mode, which involves using it like a traditional console with more standard game controllers or using the Joy-Cons to control what happens on screen. There's tabletop mode, which involves using the tablet stood up on its kickstand on a table and playing with the system using controllers or the Joy-Cons, treating the tablet as your TV. And there's handheld mode, which allows you to slot the Joy-Cons into the tablet to use it like you would a normal tablet. The screen is touch sensitive like an iPad, but it's also usable as a great big gaming system with its many buttons and joysticks, like a Nintendo DS or Game Boy. When the Switch was first announced, I kind of thought it would be a flop. It seemed like a collection of really neat ideas that probably wouldn't come together in a cohesive manner. And it seemed that although the possibilities would be vast, especially in terms of new gameplay styles, new input possibilities, I didn't think many game companies would bother to make games for it, not when they could more easily develop for competing systems, for the Xboxes and Playstations and computers of the world, and relatively easily port their games from one system to the other due to the similar nature of those systems' controllers. So the business argument here is that you can make a game for the Xbox and then with relatively little effort make a copy of that game for the Playstation or the PC. Making a game for the Switch, on the other hand, 
because of all the crazy control options and touchscreen capabilities, would be a more difficult and more expensive proposition. But I was very wrong. The Switch has proven to be a huge success story for Nintendo. And like the Wii, it's also proven to be a breakout success amongst non-traditional gamers, meaning people who do not already spend a great deal of time and money on video games. The Wii, for its part, made a name for itself in 2006 by opening up gaming for people who hadn't felt welcomed by gaming culture or particularly drawn to the games that were available previously. Learning to use the increasingly complex controllers offered up by competitors was keeping a lot of people, especially according to available data, older demographics, people in their mid-30s and older, and women of all ages. Two demos that had never really been marketed toward, or invited into the, at the time, young male-centric culture that gaming had evolved into. The Wii invited all those people to the table. The controls were simple enough to learn within a few minutes, and the games didn't require an intense, multi-hour focus to enjoy. You could open up a game and play it with your kids, your parents, your significant other, and have a fun 10-minute round before moving on to something else. It was, in many ways, the perfect system for the early years of the smartphone revolution, which emerged at the same time, and which itself also opened up the world of casual gaming to the masses. Again, at least in part because of the intuitive controls and the new types of casual games that were suddenly available as a result of those types of inputs. The Switch has taken a similar tact. Though rather than merely streamlining and making games more accessible to more people, it's also managed to bring a lot of what's been working in the portable device market to high-end console video games. The number of sensors and input methods is fairly boggling, as is the multi-use nature of the main console hardware. Plugging all of this into what seems to be a very usable digital network, where players can buy retro games from Nintendo's massive library, all the way back to the Game & Watch and NES platforms, while also allowing for large-scale multiplayer games with people around the world, it seems to have been a winning combination for the company. The Switch is already on pace in its first year to outsell Nintendo's previous big bet console, the Wii U, and its total lifetime sales numbers. The Wii U sold about 13.5 million units from 2012 until 2017. The Switch is expected to sell 14 million units by the end of its first fiscal year. So more total sales than the Wii U, and in one-fifth the time. More broadly, the Switch is currently experiencing a sales rate that outpaces the PlayStation 2, which is the best-selling game console of all time. But the PS2 holds that title for a very good reason. It remained in production for 13 years, which is very unusual, and sold over 155 million units in that time. So the Switch, and every other modern game console, has quite a ways to go before they can claim that particular title. Okay, I feel like now we have set the scene to understand what this Nintendo Labo product is. So the Switch is this complex modular sensor-laden gaming system. The Switch Labo is a peripheral of sorts for the Switch. But instead of being a new controller or a headset or some other traditional add-on to the system, it is a collection of raw materials. Namely, it is a bunch of pre-punched cardboard sheets, some string, and some plastic connectors. The buyer of the Labo punches out these pre-punched cardboard elements and then folds and origamis them into a variety of things, from a fishing rod to a piano. When built correctly, following the instructions presented on the screen of the Switch, and using the string and other elements, these cardboard devices actually work. They function beyond what you would think cardboard would be capable of. So you end up with this cardboard piano into which you can slip your Switch tablet console, and it actually plays like a 13-key MIDI keyboard. You have a fishing rod and a reel, also made of cardboard, that you can connect to the Switch and its controllers, and you can go fishing playing custom-made games that work with this particular hardware. There's a little remote-controlled insect-looking cardboard robot that you can control wirelessly with a remote, which is also made from cardboard, all of it unified and made functional using the Switch and the Joy-Con controllers. 
There's also an amazing looking cardboard backpack and Iron Man-esque bodysuit that you can put on, which syncs your movements with the characters on screen. And from the preview, it looks like while wearing this cardboard body armor, you'll be able to control some kind of giant robot and go crashing through a city and fighting bad guys. So you'll be actually moving around in real life and punching and stuff. And the giant robot on screen will do the same because of this cardboard sensory gear that you will build and wear, which then connects wirelessly to the Switch. Now, as you may have realized from the history of the company that I presented earlier, Nintendo is pretty well known for their blue ocean strategy approach to video gaming, meaning rather than compete on the same level as everyone else, trying to outdo the other guy in terms of raw graphics and processing power and other such metrics, which is kind of what's been happening between Microsoft and Sony for the past several generations of video game consoles, Instead of involving themselves in that tangle, they aim to do things differently. They create their own subsection of the video game field, in which no one else can compete with them. Rather than a red ocean filled with blood from the combat between sharks trying to own those waters, they aim for the blue ocean, which is crystal clear and open, ready to be owned, no fighting necessary. And sometimes this works for them. The Nintendo DS and Nintendo Wii consoles were both huge successes, in no small part because they innovated product categories that didn't exist before. Sometimes, though, these ideas flop. The Virtual Boy console, for instance, was interesting, but very few people bought one. The same is true of their Wii U console and Game Boy Micro, both of which were relatively swiftly replaced by the more successful Switch and DS, respectively. I think it's fair to say that the cardboard body armor and piano facet of the video game console industry is a fairly blue ocean, at least at this point. This is a very new seeming endeavor, and it's not just clever, it actually looks fun as hell. I'm 32, and this product category is obviously aimed at children, but I kind of want one. I don't own any Nintendo products myself, but the videos for Labo make it seem like something I would totally enjoy. That's maybe down to well-constructed marketing, but I think the concept in general taps into something really compelling for people of all ages. And that, in turn, maybe taps into a broader set of movements that are taking place within the entertainment space, which gives this particular experiment more traction than it might have had at other times in recent years. One cultural connection here, I think, is with barcades and other in-person public gaming activities. A barcade, for the uninitiated, is an arcade and a bar in the same space. In some cases, it's both things, and the two are largely separated, except for the space they share, a bit like old school bars, though back in the day there was typically a game or two, while today they make it into a bigger thing with a dozen or more to choose from. Most barcades, though, take it a step further. Maybe the games are free. If you're a paying customer, maybe there are games and booze and live music. Some of the more interesting ones that I've been to have combined physical arcade games like skee-ball and mini basketball and air hockey with old school pinball machines, with digital arcade game cabinets, with living room style setups where you can sit on couches gathered around projectors or big screen TVs. So you can play consoles like the Super Nintendo or Wii with a group of friends. Still others choose a theme and stick with that. Maybe it contains only games from the 80s. Maybe it's all homebrew games made by hackers and fans rather than games made and sold by big companies. There's a diversity of options in this space right now because of a larger resurgence in public entertainment offerings. For a long while, bowling alleys and roller rinks were the cat's meow. Then entertainment became insular, and first, TVs, VCRs, and early at-home gaming systems pulled all that stuff inside and made it a product rather than a service. And later, those same elements became super common and super cheap through our smartphones and other devices. This modern resurgence seems to be the consequence of both scarcity and nostalgia. When industries swing toward cheap high-end games, the relatively clunky old-school games become more scarce, and therefore more interesting and worth paying for. And as kids who grew up with such games become adults with more money to spend, 
and fond memories of their childhood to reinvestigate, the nostalgia factor kicks in, and you can suddenly bring 80s video game cabinets into a modern version of a corner bar, and that's a cool thing to do, rather than a needless, customerless gimmick. We're seeing the same thing happen with bowling alleys, with pool halls, with shuffleboard courts. If you've never played laser tag or trampoline dodgeball, I highly recommend both. These are things I enjoyed as a kid, and I find they're even more charming and fun today, and that I'm willing to pay more to indulge in them as I get older. Another part of this resurgence, it would seem, is the pivot in activities people are looking to partake in with their friends. Stats on the younger generation, particularly those in their low 20s and younger, are not as keen on drinking and other high-risk activities as those in older generations have traditionally been. As a result, the market for arcades and independent theaters and escape rooms, which is another thing you should totally try if you haven't yet, by the way, these are all exploding. It's hard to say how big some of these industries can become, and even how big they are today, as they are still growing and haven't seemed to peak yet. And for many of them, organizations that might measure their influence and lobby on their behalf have yet to form. But the numbers that we do have are already huge compared to the numbers of a decade ago. The best data I could find for escape rooms, for instance, which are not great numbers, but they seem to be fairly legit, but they show a hockey stick growth curve that all industries hope to achieve. At the end of 2014, there were 22 escape room companies in the United States. By the second quarter of 2017, about three years later, there were over 1,800. Another broad movement with which the Switch Labo intersects is that of the Maker Movement, Maker with a capital M. The Maker Movement is a modern iteration of the DIY, or do-it-yourself culture. There is cross-pollination with hacking and open source and digital things like that, but also a lot of focus on hardware and building things with your hands, on soldering and carpentry and electrical know-how. The Maker Movement is perhaps best understood by visiting a Maker space, which is perhaps a room, perhaps a building, usually filled with all kinds of equipment and tools and other resources, along with people using all those things. And the people are generally willing to help you figure out how to build whatever it is you want to build and to up your skills in these areas in general. This culture has experienced a resurgence as technologies and tools have become more inexpensive and accessible, and as the know-how required to make things has become more widely available via platforms like YouTube and blogs. It's also, I would guess, at least in part a response to the increase in walled garden-style products like the iPhone that are difficult or impossible to repair at home by yourself, and which in turn seem to encourage planned obsolescence and compulsive consumption of such gadgets. A shift in the opposite direction would include more homemade, open source, and infinitely repairable and upgradable devices and objects, and those are key areas on which the maker movement tends to focus. The maker movement has gotten a recent shot in the arm due to the popularity of cheap and relatively easy-to-use computing hardware, like Arduino and Raspberry Pi single-board computers, which can be had for as little as $5 and which can be used to power anything from a full-blown mouse and keyboard computer to an Internet of Things-based automatic plant watering device. Larger companies have also gotten in on the action, and LEGO in particular has done an impressive job making some of these philosophies and skills available to kids through their Mindstorms projects, which allow you to build stuff like robots out of LEGOs and then program them to do all kinds of things, some that are included with the instructions and a whole lot more that are later developed by a mini-maker community that exists for these particular products. There's another subculture that, in my mind at least, is an offshoot of the maker culture, and it's loosely affiliated with the open source world as well, but it doesn't really have its own label yet, as far as I'm aware. This subculture is defined by a propensity to use modern technology alongside cheap, often self-made components to bring increased capability to more people. One very popular manifestation of this idea was produced and distributed by Google via their Google Cardboard VR headset. 
This headset came as a pre-punched sheet of cardboard, much like the Nintendo Labo components, and you could fold it into a virtual reality headset, into which you could then slide your smartphone. A magnet and a metal washer was added to the design to make an external button or trigger. Lenses were included to help with depth perception, and sometimes a rubber band was included to ensure that it stayed closed during use. But in essence, this innovation reduced the cost of trying out virtual reality from hundreds of dollars minimum to something more like a few bucks. And in many cases, these headsets were practically free. The New York Times famously gave away tens of thousands of cardboard VR headsets to their readers when they launched their own virtual reality journalism experiences. Because this invention, this cheap materials-based riff on an expensive technology, had gotten so cheap that they could produce and distribute them on scale for essentially nothing. Another facet of this community is seen in projects like Open Source Ecology, which is a website that features instructions on how to build machines, specifically 50 different machines that are required to build and sustain a small civilization, build it up from scratch, but to build a civilization of a relatively small size that enjoys modern comforts. Pitched as a guide for the end of the world and with the implication that this would be super useful post-apocalypse, this site also serves as valuable perspective, showing first just how reliant we are on some truly boring technology that we will need to either reinvent or quickly rebuild if something bad happens to the current nations of the world. And second, it shows just how capable we are of doing so, of building these things. We can build from relatively inexpensive materials our own 3D printers, our own micro tractors, our own cement mixers and heat exchangers. And using modern technology, we can actually work through more iterations of these devices than we'd be able to do from hand, making the process of building these rudimentary systems even simpler, cheaper, and better. So using this guide, you might be able to build yourself a solid piece of farm equipment that seems like a stone hammer compared to the smartphone in your pocket, but that clunky farm equipment was optimized by similar technologies to those in your smartphone and could, in a pinch, allow for the development of a civilization that could then go on to invent the next smartphone. Much of the 3D printing world shares a similar ideology that you can use expensive high-end technology to bring other expensive high-end technologies down to earth, making them more affordable and attainable by more people. If you can mass produce a useful tool out of something like cardboard and have users construct it themselves, you can trim something that would have been niche and too expensive down to the cost of a few bucks and 15 minutes effort. That's pretty remarkable. And the last and perhaps one of the biggest influences from which the Switch Labo project draws inspiration is the world of board games. And board gaming is particularly interesting right now because it, like the Google Cardboard ecosystem, also makes use of new technologies to breathe life into what might otherwise be flimsy, boring cardboard, while also making use of commonly available technologies and even 3D printing to reinvent an older industry that hadn't seen much innovation for a very long time. Now, for many people, myself included, the game Settlers of Catan serves as a gateway board game. It demonstrates possibilities for board games that those of us who grew up in the U.S. at least would have had trouble imagining, stuck as we were for so long with Monopoly and poker and chess, and nothing much more recent than that, aside from maybe Hungry Hungry Hippos, which arguably was less a board game and more of a health hazard for small children. Catan, though, is a simple game with infinite replay value. It's basic enough to learn in 10 minutes, but complex enough to never fully master. It relies on inbuilt systems of chance and strategy and pairs that with the necessity for playing off your enemies and building alliances, being social, not just clever. It encourages many types of play and exercises the mind, despite it being made out of cardboard, paper, plastic, and little pieces of wood. Catan was released first in Germany, where it was developed and then around the world, in 1995. It and similar games were the beginning salvo of a neo-board gaming movement, which led to increased interest worldwide, but still in a somewhat limited way. 
Those who were into games generally got more into this new movement than others, and although there were tournaments and groups formed around this hobby, it was still pretty niche, especially in economic terms. The next big moment in this movement came with the founding of Kickstarter, an online platform that allowed creators of things to crowdfund their projects. In essence, allowing prospective customers to pay for products before those products were made. The impact that this platform had on the board gaming industry cannot be overstated. It flipped the funnel, allowing would-be game makers to make their games, earning money with their good ideas, and then later, sometimes years later, sometimes just months, delivering that concept as a physical reality, as a product. Before Kickstarter, a game would need to be accepted by a major board game company, which would then typically buy the rights and make it themselves, largely excluding the developer from that process. As a consequence, much of what landed on shelves were things that were based on past ideas and which were beige enough to be inoffensive and acceptable to as many people as possible. Post-Kickstarter, though, makers could aim at a very narrow audience, producing products that appealed to, for instance, people who wanted to play a game where they are survivors of a zombie apocalypse in a world populated by characters based on science fiction and fantasy pop culture, and with rules that have role-playing game elements. Some of the most successful Kickstarter board game products have names like Exploding Kittens, Kingdom Death Monster 1.5, The Seventh Continent, and Zombicide. Many of these projects make millions of dollars from funders, and this preemptive development process has led to a renaissance in the board gaming space, expanding the market and increasing the overall quality of the products produced. New businesses have been founded to produce high-quality collectible miniatures that can be included with the games, some of which are limited edition, available only to Kickstarter backers. Other companies, which specialize in making the cardboard components or printing the boxes or generating the marketing collateral for the Kickstarter page, the sales copy, the photos, the introduction video, they have also done quite well for themselves. Some of these games make use of supplementary smartphone apps and other technologies to operate optimally or add new functionality. Ultimate Werewolf, for instance, took an old campfire party game and formalized it introducing a slew of new characters and rules. It also included an optional smartphone app that would automate the entire process based on the rules and characters you specified, which would, in practice, allow everyone to play, whereas before, you'd need to have someone willing to be the narrator, the game master. Tech plus board game equals better board game. But technologies have blended with traditional gamery in other ways as well. Many of these games are complex and require a great deal of experimentation and balancing before they go to market. Modern printers and other at-home publishing tools help makers produce early versions of their games, and some even make use of these tools later. The creators of Cards Against Humanity, for instance, have made a trial version of their game available so that anyone can print it out at home or use it just as they would the real game. They also have printable card sets available for regional variants of their game, so they can be specified and optimized for people who speak everything from Spanish to Slovak. Some board game developers also invest in at-home 3D printers, allowing them to make their own plastic miniatures and other board gaming components. For those who want the same power but don't have the resources to get a decent 3D printer of their own, companies like Shapeways provide such services on demand in over 50 different materials from plastic to steel to gold. Just as print-on-demand services changed the publishing industry, they've also changed the board gaming industry, and in similar ways. The traditional economic forces in this space have been upended and forced to play ball with the little guy. New market segments have emerged, new niches have been recognized and honored. There are now many companies in the business of producing games tailored to groups that have been traditionally ignored by the monolithic entities that have always been too big to notice or produce for them in the past. But the business aspect of board games aside, here we have another place in which we are combining modern technology with cheap materials and good ideas to create something interesting and accessible that can be enjoyed by groups large and small. Many board games today operate algorithmically. You can play Zombicide alone if you want, 
because the mechanics of the game operate much like a video game, and the players typically work as a team against that algorithm, one that manifests through cards, cardboard, and plastic miniatures. But even those games encourage collaboration and socializing, just as products like the Nintendo Labo and Google Cardboard and barcades and escape rooms do. Our common entertainments have sucked us into our phones all day long, so the ones we seek out when we're looking for something different often take us in the opposite direction. I like to think that games, just like any technology, are what we make of them. They're not universally bad, not universally good. There are games that will be boring to you personally, and games that will hit just the right notes, and perhaps grab your attention to a worrying degree for a period of time. Some games can tell us stories, others can give us the space in which to tell our own. Some games are just mindless fun, while others exercise mental muscles we seldom have the opportunity to flex in real life. We can bend these sorts of entertainments to whatever purpose we decide to prioritize, and increasingly, the range of possibilities within these spaces are nearly infinite. You can program an app, write a book, make a film, build an in-person experience, or create a board game. And at every level, in all of these spaces, we are more capable than we would have been a decade ago. There are more ways to express what we want to express, to accomplish what we want to accomplish, and more people are capable of doing so. The tools are there, and they are increasingly within reach. Some of us will make use of these newfound powers, and others will enjoy the fruits of those creations. In both cases, though, it's a good thing that these experiences, these possibilities, are becoming more distributed and equitable. We're not at the point where we all have the same sized megaphone quite yet, but we have reached a point where something as simple as a piece of cardboard can be used to build a flourishing industry or tell a compelling story, or both. In my mind, that's a step in the right direction. The book that I'd like to recommend today, that is not my book, is called Void Star. And this is a book by Zachary Mason, and it's outstanding to me in two different ways. The plot itself is quite good, and it's predicated on kind of a post-singularity situation where there's runaway artificial intelligences, and there are three people and three interconnecting stories that touch on that main plot point. But the remarkable things about this book is that first, it's very well written, and not all good speculative science fiction novels are good in the same way. Some are really good conceptually, but terribly written, and you kind of learn to suffer through that because the ideas are good enough that it's, it's worth the slog. This book is very well written. It would be well written even if the ideas were bad. It would probably be an enjoyable story. But then second, the ideas are quite good, and primarily the ideas built into the background. This world in which these characters live is fully realized, and it's fully realized in a way that you can see where everything came from based on where we are today. So this is not like a super futuristic book where everything is spaceships and lasers. This is a book set in a recognizably near future, primarily recognizably near future San Francisco. And enough has changed that you're like, oh my god, what happened? But at the same time, you can kind of figure it out. You can see in these extrapolations the natural extension of things that are happening now, whereas today they are the root in this book. They have taken full bloom. So in terms of housing situations and economic disparity, the role of corporations in kind of a post-state metanational world, the consequences of the sea level rising, different efforts by technologists to try to educate and uplift economically the poor, and some of the consequences of, I guess, what you would call cybernetics, the integration of humans with our technology at a slightly more advanced version than we have now, but again, something that's still kind of recognizable based on current technology. So all of these things are happening in the background along with the foreground plot point that deals a lot with a post-singularity artificial intelligence achieving some type of consciousness type of situation. All of it's very well put together. A very enjoyable read. So if you get the chance, Void Star by Zachary Mason is very much worth your time. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com, and you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode at letsnotethings.com. 
Feel free to reach out and say hello on social media. I am at Colin is my name pretty much everywhere. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.